Today we are continuing uh, the series we started last week called Foundations, and what we're doing in this series is we're looking at some of the foundational beliefs and core doctrines of the Christian faith. We're talking about what Christians believe, and uh, let me start with this story. I heard a story about a boy named Johnny. Uh, Johnny was experiencing some problems at school. He kept getting in trouble, and of course, his parents were really concerned, and so they decided to make an appointment for little Johnny to go visit with the local parish priest. They thought, hey, if anybody can straighten this kid out, it's the local parish priest. So uh, little Johnny shows up for his appointment, and the priest is thinking, hey, I'm going to start with the basics with this kid. So he sits Johnny down, and he asks him, Johnny, tell me, where is God? You know, obvious answer. He's in heaven. He's all, all present. He's everywhere. And Johnny doesn't say anything. He just looks nervous. And the priest is a little bit agitated. You know, like, work with me here, kid. He's like, Johnny, tell me, where is God? Johnny starts to get nervous and squirm a little bit. And finally, the priest just slams his down, hands on the table, frustrated, and says, Johnny, tell me, where is God? At that point, Johnny shoots up out of his chair. He gets out. He runs out the door and runs all the way home. When his dad gets home, he asks him, Johnny... How did your visit go with the priest? He said, Dad, they've lost God down at the church, and they're trying to blame me for that too. <laughs> now, I know we're joking around here today, church, but this story speaks to the reality, a reality in our culture and even in the church. In a sense, many people have lost God because the notion that they have of God doesn't necessarily resemble the God to us who's revealed in Scripture. You see, many people start out believing in God uh, as a child, but their concept of God never matures. They kind of have this, you know, Santa Claus cartoonish picture of who God is. And when they experience things in life that contradict this view of God, this concept of God, it causes them to, to lose their faith and maybe even walk away from belief in God altogether. Maybe some of you have experienced that. But here's the question. What if the God you're struggling to believe in never existed in the first place? What do I mean by that? I've witnessed a lot of people talk about how they no longer believe in God or they, they couldn't possibly believe in God. I read about this a lot on social media as I see people interacting in the comments. And then I'd hear them describe the God they don't believe in. And I think to myself, well, I don't believe in that version of God either. I don't recognize them from your description. I mean, there are a lot of different views and concepts of who God is. Maybe some of you will recognize this, this list. Here's the first one. There's the genie in the bottle God. This is the God who exists to grant your every wish. You know, this is the God who's kind of like the cosmic Amazon Prime. It's his job to answer every, every prayer you have and to deliver every wish on demand. But how many of you have discovered that God often doesn't answer your prayer requests on your timetable? And a lot of people who have this view of God end up being really disillusioned and disappointed with God as they go through life. And then there's guilt trip God. Come on, how many of you grew up with that concept of God? Guilt trip God. This is the God who can never be satisfied. He's always angry with you. So you have to do different things to appease him. And there's a lot of good things you're obligated to do to win his favor, but you're never really sure where you stand with him. You always kind of feel guilty. It's guilt trip God. Some of you were given that view of God growing up. Then there's anti-science God. This is the view of God that constantly pits science against faith. It's anti-intellectual. You know, there are some Christians who would say, quit asking so many questions and just believe. And so your faith isn't really stable. It's not really reliable. It's like a house of cards. It could crumble at any point in time if someone were to ask you a really difficult question. And then there's 
hippie God. Come on, this is like the God is just all, it's all love, man. Like God is just all love. He's good with everybody and anything. And he doesn't care about sin or how you live your life or injustice. He just loves you, man. It's hippie God. Until you open the Bible and you start reading about how God cares about how we actually live. And then you have a problem. And I think so many people have these different views of God because they've, they've never matured in their thinking about who, who God is based on what we see in, in Scripture. And it's so important that we, that we get a right view of God. The great spiritual writer A.W. Tozer wrote this in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. He said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. If you are a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, what you think about God, your concept of God is the most important thing about you because it shapes the way you experience him. It shapes the way you see the world. It shapes your, your faith. So important. And I would say today, if you're not a believer, if you're someone who struggles to believe, maybe even an atheist, I would say what you don't believe about God is the most important thing about you because now it's up to you to construct truth. Now it's up to you to explain the origin of how we all got here. Now it's up to you to explain why human beings have a sense of morality. Now it's up to you to explain why human beings should have purpose and worth and dignity, why people are even valuable. You've got your work cut out for you. What comes into mind when you think about God is the most important thing about us. And so it's so important that we have a right concept of who God is. Why? Because it's impossible to love someone who you don't really know. And Jesus told us the most important thing is to know God, to love God with everything you have. How can you love someone that you don't fully know? So today I want to talk to you about the doctrine of God. I want to give you an overview of what Christians believe about God. Now we could do a whole series on this topic alone, so we have a lot of material to cover today. I want to just give you an overview of what Christians believe about God. And, and I know we have a lot of different people in the room today. I know most of you would consider yourself to be a follower of Christ, a Christian, uh, but maybe it's been a long time since, uh, since you've thought about this, the doctrine of God. Maybe it's been since, you know, Sunday school or CCD or whatever. It's been a while. Uh, maybe for some of you, you're, you're here and it's your first time in church in a while. And, and you're still trying to figure it out. And some of you, maybe you, you don't believe. You have questions. You have doubts. And I just want to say, I'm so glad you're here. Wherever you are, whatever category you're in, I'm so glad you're here today. And I just want you to know what Christians believe about God. I want you to leave this place with a better idea of what Christians have confessed and believed about God for 2,000 years. And so I want to start by reading from the Apostles' Creed. This is the oldest profession of faith in Christianity. It's called the Apostles' Creed because it's believed to be an expression of the true faith that was passed on uh, to us by the apostles. And many of you grew up in a more traditional church where maybe you read the Apostles' Creed or maybe the Nicene Creed in church every Sunday. So you'll recognize this. Some of you maybe grew up in a less formal church and this will be a little bit new to you, but this is an expression of what Christians have believed since, some, since early on. So why don't we just do this? Why don't we read this together? It's going to be on the screen. I wasn't planning to do this, but last service, people just started to read with me because some people grew up in a church where you do that. So let's read this together. Go ahead and put it on the screen, guys. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, which just means the worldwide church made up of true believers, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Hey, give yourselves a hand. That was pretty good for our first time. Now, we're a more contemporary church. We don't, you don't, we don't confess the creeds every Sunday, but I want you to know we believe this stuff. This is core, historic, orthodox Christianity, what Christians have believed at all times and all places. Now, later on, theologians would come along and they would articulate the Nicene Creed, which more fully describes the Trinity. But here's what I want you to see today, that from very early on, Christians confess the belief in God as creator, as savior, and as a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For the purposes of today's message, let's summarize what Christians believe about God with this statement. God eternally exists as one being in three distinct persons, God the Father, 
God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Each of these persons is fully God, yet there is only one God. Really important. Christians believe that God eternally exists as one being in three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So let's break this down. And this is a good opportunity for you to start taking some notes today. Here's the first one. Number one, God is eternal. Everybody say eternal. God is eternal. This refers to the timelessness of God. God exists outside of time, outside of space. He, he existed before time began. And he will continue to exist once our three-dimensional experience with time is long over. Look at what the psalmist said in Psalm chapter 90, verses 1 through 2. He said, Lord, through all the generations you have been our home. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from beginning to end, you are God. You are eternal. C.S. Lewis said uh, the fact that you and I have longings in this world that this world cannot fully satisfy, that in itself is proof that you and I were made in the image of an eternal God. And we were made for another world. Think about it. We have longings in our heart that can't be fully satisfied in this life. I'll give you one quick example. Think about death. Death doesn't sit right with us. None of us looks forward to dying. We all have this, this longing to, to live on. And, and when we lose loved ones, we, we hope and believe that we'll be reunited with them. Think about it. We are the only organisms on planet Earth who, who have a problem with death. Your dog or your cat, they're not thinking about death. <laughs> but human beings do. Why? We long for eternity because we were made for eternity in the image of an eternal God. God's timelessness means he doesn't change. It also reminds us that, that he doesn't change. And that's so encouraging to me because we live in a world that's constantly changing. Isn't it? I mean, you put on the news, like the, the current events and, and, and the world right now, it's going crazy and things are changing. And that's how our lives are, aren't they? Like our relationships change. People come in and out of our lives. And sometimes we change jobs and, and we, we just experience all kinds of, of, of change. Things in our life are, on, are constantly changing. And it's so reassuring to me to know that we believe in a God who doesn't change. In a world that changes so much, we have a firm foundation. We have a rock upon which to build our lives. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is eternal. It's eternal. Number two, God is one being. Not only is God eternal, God is one being. I want to show you a prayer um, that devout Jews have been praying for th throughout the ages, for centuries. It's called the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 5. Look at what it says. Hear, O Israel, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. And you may recognize that prayer because Jesus gave us the great commandment. And that is the first part of the great commandment. Love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. But I want you to notice, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. God eternally exists as one being. This is so important. We believe in one being. As Christians, we are monotheists. We don't believe in three gods or multiple gods. We believe in one God. And it's so interesting because the ancient pagan cultures like the Romans and the Greeks, um, they, they had a tendency to make God in their image. And so they came up with all these different gods and goddesses. And you probably studied this in junior high and Greek mythology. And if you remember, the, the gods and the goddesses, they often took on human characteristics, didn't they? Sometimes they even had moral failings like human beings. They came down to planet Earth and had affairs with humans. And what happened is the pagans, they tend to pull God down from the heavens and bring him down to Earth and make him more like us. But the God that's revealed to us in the Bible created man in his image and revealed himself as the creator God who stands apart from everything else in creation. He's the one true God. There's no one else like him. Now let's talk about his characteristics for a few moments. The characteristics of God. Theologians have described several qualities that belong to God alone. These characteristics that we're going to talk about in just a moment, they can't be applied to any other any other being, any other creation in all of the universe. And the list of attributes is known as the, the perfections of God. And you can read more about this. We don't have time to go through all of them. There are several. I want to give you three of the most, most important, three of the most important ones. For the purposes of, of today's message, we're going to look at these three. God is omnipotent, God is omnipresent, and God is omniscient. The prefix there, the prefix there, omni, means all. He's all powerful, all present, all knowing. Let's talk about how God is 
omnipotent first. God is omnipotent. This means God is all-powerful. Let's look at the Apostles' Creed again. Look at what it says from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. That is a reminder that Christians confess and believe that God is all-powerful. And I think one of the greatest examples we have is simply from the very first uh, uh, verse in the Bible, from the creation story, the, the reminder that God created the, the heavens and the earth. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We believe that only God has the power to create everything from nothing. The Latin phrase in theology is ex nihilo, out of nothing he created everything. And it's so interesting to me that I believe modern day science actually affirms this because most, most scientists actually believe in the Big Bang Theory, that there was some kind of spark that set the universe into motion. And guess what? Big Bang cosmology lines up perfectly with the creation story. God spoke, let there be light, bang, and it began. So if you, if you believe that and you don't believe in God, then you have to explain what started the spark. What set everything into motion? Where does matter come from? How did we conceive of time and space? Christians believe in an all-powerful God who created everything from nothing. Number two, God is omnipresent. Not only is he omnipotent, God is omnipresent. This means God is everywhere at one time. Only God can be everywhere at one time. God is not spatially bound like you and me. We try to be everywhere at one time, but we can't do it. But God can. You know what that tells me? Every time and every place we need God, we can cry out to him and we can experience his presence. We can turn to him exactly where we are and he'll meet us there. Amen. Look at what scripture says. Look at what the psalmist said in Psalm chapter 139, verses 7 through 12. He said, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in the darkness, I cannot hide from you. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. I've read accounts of astronauts who traveled into space, and even in space, they sensed the presence of God. Buzz Aldrin, some of you will remember that name from the history books. He was part of the famous Apollo mission that landed the first man on the moon. He was the commander of the lunar module on the Apollo 11 mission back in 1969. He's the second man to ever step foot on, on the moon. Did you know that on the moon, he actually read scripture and took communion? He was an elder in his church. He actually received communion on the moon. How cool is that? Buzz Aldrin experienced the presence of God even in space, even on the moon. Come on, like the psalmist said, I can't escape your spirit. I can't get away from your presence. Even on the moon, you're there. Even in space, you're there everywhere I go. Theologians tell us that God is both transcendent and imminent. He's transcendent. What does that mean? He's transcendent in that he resides outside of space in time. He transcends the boundaries that bound us. That means he's so much bigger than my world. That tells me he's so much bigger than my problems. He's transcendent, yet he's imminent. He's imminent in that he's knowable, and he's personal, and he's able to be as close to us as a whisper. He's close to us. We can pray to the creator of the universe and actually experience his presence. Church, let me say that to you again. Get this in your head today. We can pray to the creator of the universe and actually experience his presence. In fact, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have the presence of the living God, the Holy Spirit on the inside of you so that you can gather together in a place like this and lift your hands and lift your voice and begin to experience the presence of God. How many of you felt that this morning? Literally the breath in your lungs because God is transcendent and also imminent. He's omni present, and then he's also omniscient. He's all-knowing. He possesses all knowledge. And church, I've got good news for you today. If God knows everything, that means we don't have to. Can I take a little pressure off of you today? We feel so much pressure at times to project, project that we have it all together, to be professionals, to be good parents if you're a parent, to be good whatever, to project that we have it together. But here's Something that's so reassuring to me. If God knows everything, that means I don't have to. I don't have to. When I was growing up in church, uh, we used to sing hymns back in the day. Anybody grew up in a church? We used to use the songbook and we'd sing hymns and kind of miss that sometimes. And we used to sing this one hymn called, I Know 
who holds tomorrow. I'm not going to sing it today because I don't want to offend your ears this morning. I tried out for the worship team a long time ago and my wife rejected me. Boom, fail. No. So guess what? I do my worship in the shower, all right? But let me read these words to you from I know who holds tomorrow. Here's what it says. I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry or the future for I know what Jesus said and today I'll walk beside him for he knows what is ahead. And then here's the the chorus. You may recognize this. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand but I know who holds tomorrow and I know who holds my hand. Oh, I love that. Like I, I may not know what tomorrow holds but I know the one who holds tomorrow. I may not be able to see into the future. I may have things that cause me to worry. I don't know what tomorrow holds all the time, but I know the one who holds tomorrow, and I know the one who holds my hand. I know the one whose presence is with me. I heard a pastor once say, it's hard to surprise an omniscient God. It's hard to surprise an all-knowing God. Aren't you glad that God is not caught off guard and surprised by the things that surprise you and me? We have things that come into our lives that are unexpected, and they rattle us, and they shake us. You might go to the doctor and get a diagnosis you didn't expect to get, and it causes you to worry. You might get a bill in the mail that was unexpected. Ever get an unexpected bill in the mail, you open it and your heart sinks, right? We get unexpected drama. You go into the workplace just wanting to have a good day, and there's drama in the office, drama on social media, right? And it's unexpected. I'm so thankful that God is not surprised by the things that surprise me. He's not only the God of my present, but he's the God of the future. He's not only the God of today, but he's the God of my tomorrow. He's already there. When I get to tomorrow, he's already there. And he's not caught off guard or surprised because he's all-knowing. He knows what tomorrow holds. And I think... The great struggle for you and me is that we want to be in control of our lives. See, I I find it so encouraging to know that God is all-knowing, that God is all-powerful, that God is all-present. But I think the struggle we have as human beings is that we want to be in control of our lives. We want to know everything, but God is a lot better at doing his job than we are. And what happens is when we forget these attributes of God, we begin to worry. This is why we need a message like this every now and then. we got to go back to the basics. How many of you know you never graduate from the basics? We need to come back and be reminded of some of these simple things that maybe you learned in in religious ed class or Sunday school. We need to be reminded because when we forget that God is God, that he's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, he's all-present, we begin to take all that on ourselves and we begin to worry. And what happens is we need to remember who God is. When we remember who God is, it shifts us from worry to worship. From worry to worship. And so what we need to do is go from having a microscope view to a telescope view. Let me take you back to your high school and college lab days. What happens when you look through a microscope? You peer into something that is so minute and it's magnified and it becomes bigger so that you can see it. Well, guess what, church? That's what happens with our problems. We begin to look at our problems and our world and our little small world becomes so big. We become so overwhelmed by our problems. But what happens when you look into a telescope at night? You look out and you see the vastness of the universe. You see the stars. You see the moon. You see the, the, the planets. And you're reminded, like, I am so small. And the universe is, is so big. And so what, what happens is when we begin to focus on God and how big he is, our worship, our worry is transformed into worship. And we have this sense where we can say, I am so small. And my problems are so small. They are nothing in comparison to the size of my God, who is all-knowing who is all powerful, who is all present. Can I just encourage you? Here's what happens. We get our heads so buried into these devices right here, you know, these little minute devices, and we get so sucked into the bad news alerts that we get on this thing. We get so sucked into the negativity on social media. We get so sucked into the messages and the beeps and the alerts and the texts that come from our coworkers that stress us out. Can I just encourage you, every now and then, we've got to put this away and lift our eyes to the heavens and be reminded of how big our God is. My best times of prayer are when I put this away and I get out on some trails out in nature, and I pray. I love an open heaven. It causes me to dream. It causes me to remember how big God is. If you see me in a park, and you think I'm talking to myself, your pastor has not lost his mind. I'm talking to Jesus. It's me and the birds and the squirrels. Just give me some space, because I'm talking to Jesus. Some of my best prayer times are just to get out to an open sky and remember how big God is. God is, he's eternal. He's, He's one being, and he is also He's also 
exists in three distinct persons. Let's review. He's, he's an eternal God. He is he's one. And number three, God exists in three distinct persons. Now, this is the doctrine that sets Christianity apart from all other religions, that God has revealed himself as one being in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What happens is we attempt to describe what we see revealed in Scripture. We see that God is one, and yet we see in different times in Scripture that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we describe him as a trinity. And there are so many scriptures about this in the Bible, but I want to just show you one example from the gospel of Matthew chapter 3. So this is when Jesus went to the Jordan River to be baptized by John the Baptist. Let's look at this, Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Verse 17, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Did you notice it? All three beings of the Trinity. So here's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in flesh and blood, who actually goes to the Jordan River. He was actually there. I, I can picture it. I've been to the Jordan River. I've been there. I've been baptized. If you're wondering what it's like, the water is cold and there's some ankle biter fish up in there. <laughs> it's a sacred moment if you can get past the fish biting your ankles. <laughs> Jesus in flesh and blood, the Son of God, goes to be baptized and the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove and the heavens open and we hear the voice of Father God affirming his Son. There it is. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's just one example. And so each person of the Trinity has a distinct role and identity within the Godhead. There's, first of all, God, the Father, who is the, the creator, who sends his Son and, and Spirit into the world. We may say that he's the source of divinity. It's wonderful that Jesus revealed him as a Father, that we can know God as a, a Father. He's the giver of every good gift. That's who Father God is. Then there's Jesus, the Son, who existed with the Father from the very beginning at creation. John chapter 1 tells us, calls Jesus the Word, that the Word was God. The Word was with God before everything was created. Jesus was not created. He was present at creation, always God. Yet he stepped out of the majesty of heaven, out of eternity, and he took on flesh and blood. He constrained himself to time and space for a season to bring about our salvation. Took on flesh and blood. Walked in our shoes to bring about our salvation. And then there's the Holy Spirit is the person of God who glorifies the Father and reveals the Son to us. He's the presence of God in this world. He's the reason we can experience the presence of God anywhere we go. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Now, if it's hard for you to get your head around that idea, if you say, Pastor Jimmy, the idea of three persons in one, that sounds like a contradiction. If that's hard for you to get your head around, then you're doing theology just about right. Because the Trinity stretches our minds to their limits. It does. In fact, one theologian said that the fundamental problem with understanding the Trinity is the limited ability of human language to do justice to the transcendent aspect of God. Because God transcends time and space and anything we can possibly describe. And so human language can never fully adequately express these divine realities. Now, I've heard different examples used to try to explain the Trinity, and they're helpful. You know, there's the mathematic example, one times one times one equals one. Uh, there's the, the example of the egg. You know, an egg has three parts, the shell and the yolk, right, and the, and the, and the white, and all three parts of the egg, and, and uh, all three parts go together. They're all part of the egg. Then I've heard the analogy that St. Patrick used when St. Patrick went to evangelize the people of Ireland. He used the clover and the three leaves of the shamrock to help them understand the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. And while each of these analogies is helpful, they all still fall somewhat short of describing a God who's revealed himself as three persons in one. And so the Trinity is not so much a truth to be explained as it is a truth to be experienced. God has revealed himself as a trinity in scripture, and so we step into the trinity by faith. We step into the mystery of the trinity by faith. And let me give you another analogy that I think is so helpful. Theologians in the early church, they actually described the trinity as a dance. They pictured each member of the Godhead enjoying perfect 
community and a flow of love and oneness and, and divinity and diversity in a circle and a dance, holding hands, dancing together. And I think that's a beautiful picture because first, the Trinity describes for us how God relates to himself. God already existed in perfect community. God was already happy and satisfied. He wasn't lacking anything. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit existed in perfect unity and perfect community in this divine flow of love. But think about this, the God who didn't need anything decided to create you and me. And he welcomes us into the dance to come and join him and to be a part of this flow of love. Now, how many of you have ever been to a good celebration, maybe a good wedding, family celebration, and there was dancing, and there was joy, and there was family and friends, and somebody pushed you into the middle, and you were dancing with everything you had, and you didn't even care how good your dance moves were because there was so much love and so much celebration and so much joy. And then you saw the video later on, and you were a little bit embarrassed. But that's the picture. Like God invites us into this circle of love. God invites us into the Trinity to know this joy, to know love and joy and peace, to know His presence, to know His grace, to know this perfect community that existed before the foundations of the world. And He invites you and me into that dance. He's transcendent, yet He's imminent. He exists and resides outside of time and space, yet He has revealed Himself to us so that we can know God in a personal way. And so church, it's so important, especially for those of us who profess to be followers of Jesus, that we have a right concept of who God is. Because it's impossible to love someone that you don't fully know. So we wanna know him in the right way. And so I'm gonna leave you with three questions to meditate on. And the questions are gonna build upon each other and you can take a picture of them. Here's the first one. Number one, what about your view of God needs to change? What about your view of God needs to change? In light of all that we've talked about today, based on how God has revealed himself to you, what aspect of your view of God needs to be adjusted so that you can trust him more? Maybe you recognize as we were kind of laughing at some of those different views of God, maybe you recognize that some of those views we talked about earlier kind of describe how you see God. And maybe it's time to have a more accurate picture of who he is so that you can trust him more. Maybe you're here today and you're not a believer. I hope that this description of what Christians believe about God helps you because we believe this is the most important issue in the world. We believe that your eternity is at, at stake and we say that in a loving and gracious way and we would invite you to make sure before you dismiss God that you actually probe and question, study what Christians have professed to believe for 2,000 years. Number two, what step do you need to take to know God better? What step do you need to take to know him better? The God of the universe desires to have a relationship with you and has revealed himself in such a way that you can actually know him. The God of the universe, eternal God, all-powerful God, all-knowing God, all-present God desires to have a relationship with you and he's revealed himself in such a way that you can actually know him. So what are we doing about that? What step do we need to take so that we can love him better and know him more? Maybe it's opening the word of God for yourself to begin to read his word. Maybe it's spending time in prayer. It's like I said, getting out, getting off of that phone and lifting your eyes to him and praying and having a relationship with him. Maybe it's being here on a Sunday morning, like church isn't gonna be optional. It's not gonna be something we do every now and then if the kids don't have sports, if we're not too busy. No, 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 I'm gonna be in the house of God with the people of God so I can experience the presence of God because God, I cannot live without you. What do you need to do to know him better? And then number three, let me ask you this question. Are you entering into the dance? Are you entering into the dance? Are you embracing the reason you were created and glorifying God with your life and enjoying a relationship with him? Are you experiencing love and joy and peace and the goodness of God and the presence of God? I love the words of the Westminster Catechism. It's an old Protestant confession. And it starts with this, it says, the chief end of man is to love God and to enjoy him forever, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Are you enjoying God? Some of you were given a view of God that you endure God. You just hope that he's happy with you. You feel like you can never live up to his expectations. 
But are you glorifying him and enjoying him forever? Is there a sense that you wake up in the morning and you think about him? When your head hits the pillow at night, you're grateful for his goodness in, in your life. Is there a sense that you're walking with him, that you're in the dance, you're in rhythm with him, you're in step with him according to his ways, according to his desires, according to his principles, feeling him smile over your life in the good and the bad, walking with him hand in hand. And here's the amazing thing. The Holy Spirit will gently show you the areas of your life where you're out of sync, where you're out of rhythm, so you can get back into that circle and enjoy this beautiful dance, this relationship with a God who desires to know you and the fellowship with you. And so why is all this important? Because here's the thing, all of us, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, we're all gonna have days where we have questions. We're all gonna have days where we have doubts. We're all gonna have disappointments with God. You might say, well, Pastor Jeremy, do you have questions? You better believe I do. I've studied theology at some of the deepest levels and it causes you to have questions. When I get to heaven, I got some questions for God, but I guarantee you when I get there and the veil is pulled back, I'm gonna understand things in a way that I can't run out because I'm bound by time and space and this body and this world. Of course I have questions. We're gonna experience hurts. We're going to experience disappointments. We're going to have times like we're going through right now in our world where we say, God, why is the world like this? Why is it so broken? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there so much pain and suffering? And in those times where we wonder where God is and what God is like, we look no further than the person of Jesus Christ, naked and bleeding, hanging on a cross. This is the God who came near to us, who met us where we are, descended into our brokenness, has walked in our shoes, who's experienced every emotion we've experienced. He's experienced hurt and disappointment and rejection, even death on a cross. That's who God is. The God who loved you enough to come down into the mess and the shame and brokenness of our lives. Whenever you wonder where he is, whenever you're walking in confusion, whenever you wonder, God, what are you like? What are you doing? Look no further than the person of Jesus Christ. God in flesh and blood, his love, his grace, his goodness embodied in a person who came to you and me so that we could know God and have a relationship with him. Would you bow your head for a moment as we pray, as we encounter the living God afresh today, as we think about those questions today, as we think about those questions, God, where does my, what does my view of you need to change and what step do I need to take to know you better and how do I more fully enter into the dance of walking with you, knowing you, walking in rhythm and in step with you? And so, Father, we thank you for your word today. God, we thank you that you are a good, loving, heavenly Father. You are creator God. You are eternal. You are all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present. And yet you have chosen to reveal yourself to us as a loving, heavenly Father. Through your Son, Jesus, through your Spirit in this world. And God, we're praying that we'd have a greater revelation of who you are. God, correct any wrong notions that we've had of you to be reminded of who you truly are because we want to know you better and love you more. And God, we pray that you would give us a greater desire to know you. If you've revealed yourself, then you somehow want to have a relationship with us. And it, it blows our mind to think that the God of all creation would, would, would want to know us. But God, we have to admit there have been times where we haven't paid attention to you or made time for you or prioritized you. And so God, we're asking today that you would give us a greater desire to know you. Some of you need to pray that, to, to know you, God. Give us a greater desire to walk with you and to know you. And Father, we pray that you would help us to enter into the dance more fully, to enjoy you, to glorify you, to glorify you with our work and our play and our relationships and our words and our finances and the way we treat people, to recognize that our existence in this world is to walk with you and to know you and to glorify you with our lives. Thank you that we have purpose, God. And Holy Spirit, we're asking that you would show us the places where we've been out of step. Give us a gentle nudge back into, into the dance, into the circle, so that we can be in fellowship with you. God, we thank you for it. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen.